Hello and welcome to the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast with me, Errol Lawson. In whatever environment God has placed you in, as his son or daughter, he expects you to lead, to set a godly example for others to follow. The Rising Generation Podcast is where we equip you to lead effectively. On each episode, I interview Christian leaders with national and international influence and ask them questions about their leadership journey. Hopefully, their answers will inspire you to make an impact in your generation. Thank you for listening. So hello and thank you for joining us again on our podcast. I have the honor today of being sat with Reverend Dr. David Carr. Dr. David Carr is the Bishop Abbot of the Order of St. Leonard. He's the Senior Pastor of Renewal Christian Center in Solihull and the National Overseer of the Free Methodist Church of Europe. A writer, broadcaster, pastor, Bishop David travels extensively across the globe sharing his vision and leads his church to some of the most deprived areas of the world with missions aimed at alleviating the struggle of orphans, disabled children, and people whose lives have been devastated by disaster. Closer to home, he founded a mission to feed families within the local region who found themselves in difficulty, now termed the Fourth Emergency Service by Solihull's Mayor, and he's a patron of the Gateway Foundation, a charity to support and mentor recovering drug addicts, alcoholics, and ex-offenders. Reverend Dr. David Carr, please fill in any gaps, anything I've missed out there. I know it's a quite an extensive biography, but if I've missed anything out there, please fill in the gaps for us and give us an insight and a glimpse into your world right now. Yes, great. Good to speak to you. I also am the Honorary Chief Chaplain for the Heartlands Group of Hospitals, so I'm bored with nothing to do, as you can see with all that. So and also, I'm a Vice Chair at one school and a New Christian Academy. I'm the patron of a New Christian Academy that's opening in Birmingham. Wow. So that should be... They all get up to Tuesday sorted out in my week. <laughs> so that's not bad for a 70-year-old, is it? Wow. And at the moment, I'm involved in all those things and uh, seeing the progression of a brand new team in our church. We've just appointed 10 new people Wow! in the last year and is fashioning those. Most of them are young people that we brought up from within and it's seeing them now expanding into, into a wide ministry in a very large church in English standards anyway. Mm-hmm. And, and that's quite a challenge. So I'm like a father figure now. Or in the football analogy, I'm dropping further back and allowing the kids to do the running. Fantastic. Fantastic. So I know you haven't always been doing what you're doing right now. You've not always been in ministry. Can you tell us the story of of that transition story, how you transitioned from where you were beforehand to what you're doing now? I was in financial services, (coughs) had my own brokerage, majoring on pensions, especially footballers. I had 700 footballers on my books. And then I, I was taken over by the Professional Footballers Association, became their marketing director, dealing with footballs on their transfers, pensions, finances, buying of houses, businesses, everything. But in the midst of that, I had a, a call to plant a church in Solihull, Hall. And that seemed a bit of a, a dichotomy, really, doing both. I was traveling 40,000 miles a year. I could be at Manchester City one day, Plymouth Argyle the next, and <clears throat> on the road. But four of us got together and, and started to do that, Realising that would be a call of my life, I took one day a week out of football uh, with Gordon Taylor's permission, who's the chief exec, and I studied uh, theology five years. I should have taken three full-time, but five part-time. While I was doing football, got ordained in 78, and uh, that went on for 21 years, running a church, took, took it up to about 400. I became a superintendent, the only part-time superintendent they ever had, overseeing, I think it was 30, the top 32 churches in the Birmingham area and the black country, and I did work for Central Television, and uh, so I was doing all those things, plus some football, uh, had a heart attack when I was 42, surprise, surprise, who would have believed it took that long, changed the whole course of my life, thought about it, just coincided with the church going up to about 400, needing a full-time pastor. Many said, I shouldn't have gone full-time until then because I'd have demanded too much and that I'd have been a nuisance to all the staff because I'd be looking over their shoulders saying, what are you doing now? Why are you doing that? And why aren't we doing this? So they thought when the church was up to 400, there'd be enough to keep me busy mm-hmm. and keep me away from everybody else mm-hmm. because um, 
I'm a visionary, I'm an ideas man, so I can have ideas three times a day. Mm. The problem is, is is putting it into, into application. Let me ask you a question there, because on this... What I'm hearing here is it's like there's there's such a, a massive capacity here, like to be doing all of that um, whilst to, to be leading the church, overseeing churches, um, running over seven hundred different footballers on your books and at one point, three kids. and married three kids, like. Okay, so I'm right now, I've just planted a church about eight months ago with just a few members at the moment and running a business. I mean, like 50 odd schools across the Midlands. Yeah. How do you grow your capacity? Maybe there's somebody else listening right now as well. And you're trying to juggle these, the, the, you're bivocational. How do, you, how do you grow your capacity to that size? Now, the unique thing is that some things we all have in common, doesn't matter who we are. There's only 24 hours in a day. Mm. We all have that. So it's not... I wish I had more time. It's how do you manage what you've got? Mm. And if you think about it, we used to have to do this in business. You split your day into threes, morning, afternoon, and night. There are three capacities in time. Ideal world, we sleep for eight hours. We play for eight hours. We work for eight hours. One firm became very, very famous in their marketing by saying, our product, if you're negative, will put weight on, rot your teeth, and destroy your appetite. So how do you market a product that does those three things? They suddenly realize it contains sugar. Now, sugar is dangerous. But what sugar does produce is energy. So one particular brand for years have run on the motto, a mile today will help you work, rest, rest and play. play. And those are the three areas of your life. Mm. So what you have to do is you split your week up, three sections per day times seven, 21 sections. Now, you put down your necessities that is non-negotiable. How many hours do I need to sleep? Now, of course, we all differ. I need five hours, no more. If I stop in bed longer than that, I have a headache. So with me, I take five hours out of my 21 portions. I take five out every day. <laughs> That's non-negotiable. If I'm not going to get the five hours, I can't do anything else. To you listening, it could be eight hours. <laughs> Sadly, some of you 10 hours, but it means now you've got to look at the time I've got left. Now, if you work in a job whereby you clock on at 8 in the morning and finish at 4 in the afternoon, that's a non-negotiable. You put all that in. Mm. Now you look at the time you've got left. <clears throat> now, some things we put down as priorities are not priorities. <clears throat> They're habitual. Mm. Well, I've always done it this way, and I've always watched the television for four hours. You have to put priorities. What is a priority in your life? And your priorities change. Sometimes you make the mistake where you put your priorities in the wrong area. I did that when my kids were growing up. I've now readjusted myself with my grandchildren. And then you say then, I'm left with, say, six hours to do this. Now, how can I make those six hours most productive? I haven't got time to fool about. I haven't got time to, to waste time. But if, for instance, it's in pastoral work, you cannot become so clinical that you miss out the word compassion. Mm. So what's the most important thing? Well, with me, it was loving the people. So I spent more time loving the people than I did anything else. And they put up with poor preaching, and they put up with not very good organization because they would turn around and say, he loves us. Mm. And so at that time, that was my priority because I was dealing with, when you start a church, you normally get, without being rude, everybody else's left-offs because if they're very happy in the church, they're not going to come to you. <laughs> so spending my time loving them, Grounded them. And most of the people who started with me 43 years ago are still with me now. But then I realized I had to teach them something. So I had to use some of those hours towards loving them and some hours towards studying. And I find this, when you become efficient in doing something, you can do things quicker than other people can. So, for instance, I couldn't work every day of the week if I was going to run a church. At that time, I was selling pensions before I was in football. And my market was people doing personal pensions at 25, 30, 40 pound a month. And I realized for me to earn a living doing that, I had to work six days a week. But if I could get into corporate pensions, doing company pension schemes, I need only do one a month. And that would pay all my wages, all my bills, everything. So I now started to get a strategy is how did I up market my product? How did I up market my customer? So rather than dealing with the guy who worked on the factory bench, I now wanted to work with the man who owned the factory bench. So that happened. So it means I could work three days a week and earn six days a week wage. In fact, I was working at one time two days a week and earning a month's wage. 
If you go back now that when we're doing this recording, it's 2.15. If you go back 30 years ago, in one month, I earned £30,000. Now, today, mm. that's still an annual wage. Mm. I earned that in a month because I looked and said, I only have limited time, so how can I best use that time in my business? So it meant I had to up market mm -hmm. and now deal with the boss and not with the employee. Mm -hmm. Now, I've learned this. If the boss becomes your customer, he'll introduce you to the gatekeeper, but the gatekeeper will never introduce you to the boss. Mm -hmm. Because once you tell the gatekeeper you know the boss, he'll listen to you. But if you tell the boss you know the gatekeeper, he'll ignore you. Mm -hmm. Because it's all about influence. So I upmarketed my, my, my market. Right. So that my time could be used valuably. And those are the type of things you do. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the hours you've got and say, how can I best use them? They become precious. Your hours become a resource. And once you waste one, you never get it back. And that's the only way you can do it. Thank you. And you know, that fully that was loaded. You talk, I think it's Warren Buffett. Everyone said of Warren Buffett, and it he, was he'd been interviewed once, and they asked him about his habits, and he said he reads for like three hours a day. And you know, we, we've all got twenty four hours a day, and it's it's evident that as you're saying, successful leaders, established leaders, they don't play with their time. If you're you're listening right now, and you maybe you kind of your your time management and your organization skills aren't quite where they need to be to get to that next level. We really need to think about managing our time, using our time effectively. Bishop, is there a revelation that you got at some point? Is there like a, an epiphany, an aha moment, a turning point that was significant for you on your leadership journey? You mean to become a leader or in leadership itself? In leadership itself. Maybe you were going one way and then penny dropped and you, you realized that was the way you needed to go. Yeah, I think my problem always was because, because I couldn't read and write till I was 18. I was completely illiterate. I suffered from acute dyslexia, and in my day, uh, they just put down on stupidity. And so I was very insular and a very introverted person, which those that know me now wouldn't believe that. But behind most comedians, it is a sad person. And so I, was, I, I had five major phobias. And so I did things on my own purely because I didn't want people to see my inadequacies and because I was too embarrassed to ask help. And when becoming a Christian changed me, so I learned to read in two years by reading the Bible. And then I learned to, to do maths in my head and various other things and became a very successful businessman. My hardest thing in leadership was, you're not a leader if nobody follows. So I had to learn to delegate. And that is the hardest lesson I ever learned. Wow. Because a real leader actually finishes up doing very little with everybody doing everything, but he's the one who knows what they're doing. And that was my biggest, biggest revelation is that a leader is not somebody who does everything because you don't need to be a leader. You're just a doer. Mm -hmm. And my problem was I used to be self-employed and self-employed means you depend on yourself. As mm -hmm. you know, self is the key word in self-employed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But when you suddenly realize in life, nobody's self-employed, we're all employed mm -hmm. because we're part of a bigger picture, especially as a Christian, mm -hmm. you're part of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Jesus never sent people out on their own. He sent them out in twos. Yeah because he knew very well that two can cover each other's back. Mm -hmm. If one falls, the other lifts the other up. I won't be tired if there's only one. Mm -hmm. And I think our problem is so often is we're either very lazy mm -hmm. or so proactive, um, we have to do everything because we believe that we have the whole world to save, we have the whole businesses to do. And the answer mm -hmm. is it's learning. And you start off frustratingly by using people who can't do it as well as you. The real joy comes is when actually you manage them and they can do it better than you. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean you're inadequate, it means you're a good teacher. Mm. I've got people in my staff now who can do things far better than me, and I just sit there laughing. So what, what's been your biggest challenge in your leadership journey? My biggest challenge is I am absolutely terrible at administration. Okay. And so I used to have some brilliant ideas, and they never worked. Not because they weren't good, not because they weren't from God, it's because I didn't know how to put them into operation. And so we have a great, we have a great situation in church here, is I dream the dreams... And they write them down. And the Bible says, Habakkuk says, write down the vision so that you can run with it. Mm -hmm. And to me, administration is a necessity mm -hmm. that I personally can do without. How did you figure that out? Like, how did it emerge? Was it some kind of like Colby test or Myers Briggs? Or, no, or what, it was what? just that people came to me and saying, you're a nightmare. <laughs> They'd say, uh, you mentioned something on Sunday we'd never heard about. You said we were going to do it. We didn't even know you were thinking about it. 
and you promised them a time slot that it can't be done. And so could you please just tell us before? See, sometimes you don't have to have a personal revelation. You've got to listen to what people say to you. Right. Because if people love you and they're for you, mm -hmm. they're not going to put you down. Mm -hmm. And they used to say, look, just give us the idea. We haven't got the ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody doesn't give you a piece of cloth, it doesn't matter how good a tailor you are, you can't cut it. Mm -hmm. And if uh, it doesn't matter how good a mechanic you are, if somebody doesn't give you a car, you can't mend it. Mm. So we need everybody. Yes. I'm a visionary. Mm. Most people who build anything are visionaries. Mm. However, however, unless it's Moses, mm. who had to do the whole lot himself, mm. we assume, most of us need people to build it. Now, in business, you've always got the visionary. Mm. They're the one who go out and they see where the business is going to go. Without that, you haven't got a business. Mm. But they don't have time. I, I, I remember talking to a top businessman up in Sheffield, and this is about 35 years ago, and they, they, built, they bought a new computer for their company, a quarter of a million pounds, about 30 years ago, a quarter of a million pounds. And this chief executive came in, and he got a big pile of technical data with him. And the chairman just looked at it, and he said, put that down, I want to answer you this question. Have you researched the market as well as you can? Yes or no? Yes. Do you think we need this computer, yes or no? Yes. In your reckoning, if this computer doesn't do what we want it to do, you will resign, won't you? And he went, yes. He said, buy it. He said, but you don't know all the information. No, he said, I'll pay you to do that. My job is to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he said, David, if you can't put your argument on one side, mm -hmm. one side of A4, you don't have an argument. Because busy businessmen can't and won't read lots of data. Mm. That's what his secretary uses. That's what his accountant uses. Mm. A top businessman wants the bullet points, bottom line. Can it? Will it? Should it? Could it? Do it? He said, because the top people at the top are all visionaries. Mm. So in leadership today, like it's so challenging. We see so many leaders where that often isn't the reality, you know, and they're in leadership positions. Like, how does somebody, if they recognize it, because sometimes people feel bad about themselves and they say, oh, I'm not good at that. And you have all these different tests out there that tell you how to maximize or to work on your strengths or whatever and like your weaknesses and stuff. How does somebody move? Like, if they recognize that, okay, I'm, I'm rubbish at administration, what should they do? There's two things. There's mentoring. Right. Now, you see, you can become better at something even though you're not good at it. Mm. So, for instance, when I spot in a business or in a church bad administration, panic. Because mm. if I can spot that, anybody can. Mm. Now, if you look at my PAs now, they'll tell you now, since iPads come out, I am 100% better. Right. I now keep notes on my iPad. I send emails off. I request things. So the iPad makes up for my deficiencies. So I've got that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you can be mentored. So if you've got to do something, so I've had to do things as, I've done every conceivable thing as a pastor because I didn't have other people to do it. The Bible says, if you're not an evangelist, do the work of an evangelist, which is different to being an evangelist. <clears throat> and if you don't put yourself down by saying to the people, as you know, this isn't my skill set, but I'm going to have to do it to help me. A lot of people help you. Mm. Our problem is so often is don't we're too much. proud to ask for help. Right. So there's mentoring. Mm. There's confession of weakness. Mm. There's the intention to get stronger, mm -hmm. and there's change of giftings. Mm -hmm. Because, you see, I was an out-and-out -out evangelist. My brother, who's a theologian, said he was so upset with me because I could peel a banana and get people saved. Mm -hmm. But when you're building a church, you can't just do that. Mm -hmm. And so I've changed that I used to be an evangelist. I became a pastor, and now I'm a pastor teacher. Now I can sit and teach where most of our people, I lose them, mm -hmm. where I never knew that much theology. Mm -hmm. Now I'm writing a book on theology. Mm -hmm. And so in our life, we often change right. according to our circumstances mm. and we grow into it. So how many people who become a father know how to be a father? Mm. Well, they don't. Mm. So they make mistakes. They're mm. still a father. As long as they don't drop the baby, mm. they're okay. And they may put the nappy on the wrong end of the body, but they'll mm. soon find out the right one. Mm. But then what happens is when you have a second child, you know. Yeah. And so... We can change in our giftings mm. according to where we're at. So first thing, don't say in your life, I can never do that. Mm. Just say, at this time, I don't know how to do it. Mm. And maybe I will never need to do it. But if I do need to do it, I'm willing to learn. Brilliant. 
Fantastic. We're students in life, and that's just a great message there, guys. If you're listening, just just being a student and being open to learn new things, being receptive to new ideas, being willing to ask for help, not staying stuck in any situation or circumstance, being willing to reach out and ask for that mentorship, that advice, that guidance to help you to move forward. They say that success is hidden in your daily routine, right? What does the first 90 minutes of your day look like? I'm the same as anybody else, or most people. I wake up, I get up, I shower, have breakfast, I come in here, or go to the hospital. I use the um, the Church of England daily devotion, the reading of the lectern. Then I check to see what my daily itinerary is, and plunge into it. So the first 90 minutes is getting myself ready, getting my mind ready, getting my body ready, uh, just setting myself down so I know what the Lord's saying that day, and then bang, into it. Awesome. And what have been the, the key habits that have actually to your success? Key habits? Yeah. Commitment to the project in hand. Right. Don't be half-hearted. Mm-hmm. The thing's worth doing, is worth doing well. If you haven't got the conviction to do it well, don't do it. Secondly, passion for the project in hand. If it doesn't stir you, then it's going to be clinical. Mm-hmm. So you've got to have commitment to the project, mm-hmm passion to the project, and then tenacity during the project itself. Don't give up. Too many people give up too soon. Mm. And some of my biggest failures have been I gave up a day before success. Wow. Can you give us an example? There's been many times in, in business and in church life when I've said, uh, when I've said um, it's not going to work, and people have come up to me and said, uh, oh, it's a pity you, ne- a pity you never came and phoned me because I was all ready to do that business. And I thought, I just don't believe it. I've just walked away from business. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had situations whereby tenacity of keep going. I'd signed Maradona, who was a great famous footballer, to come and play for a British club and cost me a load of money. I was going to earn a lot of money. And uh, the month he was going to sign, we declared war against Argentina. And I lost thousands upon thousands. Now, I could have just gone, that's me finished. I'm going to give up. And the answer is, even though financially that almost bankrupt me, I got up and kept going and kept going and kept going, uh, but didn't keep recalling it. Because you've got to learn, you've got to learn what tenacity is. The only difference between those that do and, and those that don't is those that do, do. So the only difference between those that do and those that don't is those that do, do. Mm-hmm. Either endures to the end, says the Bible, will be saved. And endurance is something in our society today we don't teach. Mm-hmm. We work on the basis now is if you want to not succeed, give up. But we used to be brought up with if you want to not succeed, try, try again. And the try, try is plural. Mm. Now, there's a difference between hitting your head against a brick wall. Mm. But if you ain't any good at doing something, somebody needs to tell you. So if you can't sing, just like X Factor, they tell (laughs) them you can't sing. Yes. And if you're not meant to be in business, somebody needs to sit you down and say, this is the wrong profession. Yes. But nothing was built without failure. Come on. I think it was Edison, who I think it was about seven, how many thousand ten mistakes thousand he times, made? Yeah. And he, 10,000. Yeah. And he said, I've learned this. I'm 10,000 steps nearer to it being successful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the message, guys, resilience. If you were sitting in the room that I'm sitting in right now, in the church that I'm sitting in right now, and you'd see the, the, the measure of the work that is going on right here at Renewal Christian Center, just in this, one, this project alone, you'd understand just the weight of the words that you're hearing like when David's talking about commitment and passion and tenacity like it's just this is clearly what the core values that he lives by this institution is guided by and you've got to really dig deep guys there's always going to be challenges always going to be setbacks always going to be obstacles pitfalls things don't go the way we plan them to go but you've got to make up your mind that I'm not going to give up, I'm not going to quit, I'm going to keep going until I achieve the desired outcome or the manifestation of what God has placed in my heart to do. I know that you're just beginning in one sense, you've just got 10 new <laughs> staff members in, yes, and it's, it's a reinvention in a fashion, and you know, fresh minds, fresh ideas. How would you define success now at this stage in your life? How would you define success? I've said success is reaching the potential that lies in every individual. Reaching the potential. You see, success is not the same for everybody. Now, if you're in a category that demands a prescribed success, sort of football, 
success is winning the championship or winning the FA Cup. But is it? Southampton sold nearly all their team two years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, they were projected as going down. Mm-hmm. They finished in the top half of the division, and all their supporters would say, and they didn't win anything, mm-hmm. but all their supporters would say, what a successful season, mm-hmm. because they reached the climax of the level that they personally had set themselves. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I go and see some people, and I see some pastors, I saw a pastor at a conference, and he said, I shouldn't really be here. And I said, why? He said, well, this is for big churches. I said, yeah. He said, churches over a 1,000. I went, correct. He said, I don't know why they invited me. I've only got 200 in my church. And I said, right. Where do you live? And he gave me the address. And I said, never heard of it. What city is it near? Oh, the nearest city is about 25 miles away. I said, how big is your town? He said, 4,000 people. I said, so you have 4,000 people in your town. You have 200 in your church. I said, you're bigger than I am. Wow. I have 200,000 in my town. Mm. I said, you're here, young man, because take the numbers out. You couldn't have a church of my size. Fantastic. Because it'd take up, I said, almost half of your population. Mm. And he looked at me. I said, mm. you silly lad. Mm. You're here because you're success. Mm. You're going on numbers. Mm. God's going on percentage. Mm. And his face lit up and he went, really? I said, that's why they invited you. You're bigger than we are. Wow. And he went, nobody's ever explained it like that before. And I said, you see, success is not always first past the post. Mm. It's passing the post. And some people say, it's no good me running because the guy in my company is far better than I am. He wins everything. Yeah, but hang on. A lot of races, you get a medal based on a handicap system. Mm-hmm. You know, you've only got one leg, so you're going to hop. You're blind. You're having to run with a runner. You're lame. You're... We got a girl in our church, 12 she was, spina bifida, and she said to me a real question. She said, Pastor Dave, why would God make me like this? Why can't I be like other girls? Lovely girl. I didn't know what to say to her. And I just said to her, Kerry, if God had a purpose for your life, would you better cope if he showed you? She said, yes, Pastor Dave. She goes home from that meeting, turns on the television, and the Paralympics are on, and it's wheelchair racing. She says to her dad, Dad, I'd love to have a go at that. He finds her a track in Coventry. She takes some lessons. She's had a month's lessons. When she's going around the track one day, when the English coach is there and sees her go around, and he said to his assistant, put your your watch on that woman. And he went, good gracious, she's the fourth fastest in the country. (laughs) He said, how old is that woman? She said, 12. Now, this Sunday with this interview just going past now in London, major, major athletics She raced against, she's 14 now, Paralympic champions and came second. Wow. And they say that she's destined for the Olympics. Wow. And she's winning medals everywhere. And I said to her now, I said, are you successful or a failure girl? Wow. You see, she was a failure in her eyes because she got spina bifida and Mm -hmm. she wasn't as other girls who could run around. Mm -hmm. But actually, inside that failed body was a successful Olympian waiting to come out. Wow. Now I said to her, do you think I've got a purpose for you? And she laughed. Wow. She's winning medals all over the place. <clears throat> she was interviewed on television this, this Sunday, having come second to a world champion. Wow. So you see, by the face of it, she's a failure because she hasn't got legs, mm. she can't walk, she mm. can't dance, can't mm. go out with the boys like everybody else. Mm. But inside her, mm. there's a champion wow. waiting to come out. An and that conversation meant that that girl will probably be in the Olympics representing Britain. Fantastic. Fantastic story. And, you know, we can spend so much time comparing ourselves oh, to we others. Just, we all do it. Preachers you know? do it. Singers do it. Footballers do it. I miss what's inside Neighbors us. Neighbours do it. They've got a bigger car than I've got, bigger house, newer curtains. My, oh my God. God. It's not about that. It's what can you achieve compared to yourself? Wow. Yes, it's good to have heroes. Yes, it's good to have mentors. Mm. Yes, it's good to have pacemakers mm. who will just keep you on track. That's, mm. We all need that mm. in life. You know, we just had a guy who's just won the Tour de France for the second time. Mm. Here's the fun about it. He couldn't have done it without the team that got him there. Mm. Cycling is very, very unusual product. Mm. It's that one person wins and mm. five people do all the work. Mm. The team. They don't get a medal. Right. They don't even get a mention. Mm. But he crossed the winning line, linking arms with all his other cyclists. Mm. It took a team to get in there. And anybody who thinks they're going to get anywhere on their own is a silly billy. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> we're silly jilly if you're a woman <laughs> we need each other absolutely and yeah. our problem is sometimes is we expect everybody to do anything for us or nobody to do anything for us mm. the balance is always in the middle favorite saying somebody gave me once when i was in business and struggling he said this jewish guy he said david come here he said if life gives you a lemon Make turn lemonade. it into lemonade and i've always remembered that because the lemon on its own is bitter but add the ingredients to it, and it's a refreshing drink. And somebody listening to this now, you're going through a bit of a bitter lemon experience. Well, look, get some sugar in there, and then turn and squeeze it. A bit of pain involved, a bit of effort. But then it will become a refreshing drink rather than a bitter experience. Amen. If anything was holding you back from going into leadership, what was holding you back at any time? Lack of self-confidence. Mm. I never saw myself as a leader. And a lot of people look for leadership badges, and I think I said this earlier. It's very simple, actually, being a leader, and that is you're not a leader because you've got a title. You've got a leader because when you look around, people are following you. Mm. Uh, and I never thought anybody would follow me because I always felt very inferior to everybody else. Mm. And if you feel superior, that's arrogance. If you feel inferior, that is a sense of a lack of self-worth. Mm. See, there are two extremes in life. There's always two extremes in life. Mm. There was at the cross, one who swore and cursed, and the other who said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Life is based on extremes. Mm. Even, in, even in Christianity, we, we have Calvinism and Arminianism, pre and post, mm. and, and we have Catholic and Protestant. We're always looking to extremes. The answer's always in the middle. Mm. There's the balance. Mm. It's always in the middle. With the seesaw, you're either up or you're down. You're up mm. or you're down. Mm. But the crux of it is what's the balance of the middle? Mm. And I play bowls. Mm. for my sin and it's got a bias in it and so when you bowl it one way it curves in one way mm. when you bowl it the other way it curves in the other way but if you want to go straight up the middle mm. you have to bowl it with force and it neutralizes the bias right and i always say to people especially if, if it's christian businessmen listening to us today that we've all got a bias we're either proactive underactive we're either bubbly or we're dull we're either one or the other but you see if you want to go straight up the middle, it's only through power. Wow. And you need the power of God in your life. You need the power of positive Christian thinking, and that will neutralize. So there comes a time in our life when you've got to come out of your own personality. See, it's no good you're saying, is there somebody lying there bleeding to death? Oh, no, I faint when I see blood. Get over it. Mm. That person's dying. I remember, it's a few years ago now, as you said that, I remember being in a service and you were praying. <laughs> And um, I remember you were praying, and this never left me this way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and you were praying, and literally the atmosphere just is like heaven has entered the room, man. And everybody's worshiping and walking around this church, and you were praying and just was singing and ministering and song. And it was just an amazing. I remember saying to myself, God, I want that. I want that. I want to be able to do that. How do you cultivate that? You cultivate it. See, it's a very simple thing, isn't it? If you want to be like somebody, hang around with them. Mm. And you'll find that when you've got kids, you say, I don't want you hanging around with Billy mm. because he's a bad influence on you. So if you want to be like somebody, hang around with them. Mm. If you're a Christian and you want to be like God, hang around with him. Now, when you come from the background I've come back from, with five major psychological phobias and being completely illiterate, and hating myself and wish I'd not been born. Because my faith changed me so radically, I love God. So I hang around with him. And so when you start thinking of him and start worshipping him, people can say, oh, no, you've been with him. You just like him. I love accents. So I can mimic people, not to uh, be rude to them, but I just love accents from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they go into aesthetics when I go around the world because they just talk like them. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they fall about in laughter. Think about it. How do people react when you talk like Jesus? And people go, Carl Stark, I know that's talking, that's Jesus. And when we hang around with people, we would say, oh, that's not him talking, that's Billy that he's been hanging around with. He talks like that. He's always talking like mm -hmm. that preacher. He's talking like that preacher. Oh, you see who he's been? Yeah. And if you want that experience in God or in life, mm -hmm. You are influenced by who you're with. And a lot of people want to be super spiritual, but they never spend time with Jesus. Mm. They want to be super efficient in their business, but they never work. Mm. They're waiting for the one big deal to come up that's going to set them in. And I tell you this, 
if you put all your eggs in the basket of one big deal, mm. you see, I'd rather collect six eggs from six chickens than wait for one chicken to lay six eggs. Mm. And I made my business by doing lots of little things that the big thing was the bonus. But I know a lot of businessmen fail because they spend six months waiting for a big deal and it doesn't come off the bankrupt. Mm. Daily gains. What's your biggest weakness? Not so much now because of age, but not being able to say no. Mm. Okay. And sometimes we either no, what's the question? That's a wrong attitude. But other times we go, yes, sir, leave it to me. There's an old saying, always ask a busy man to do something because he'll always do it. Mm. But there's too busy. And I got to the point where from my insecurity, I would never say no in case they didn't like me. It's not so bad now. Mm. I've got a bit of wisdom now. I mean, I've cut myself down from 75, 80 hours a week to 50. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, even now, that's more... I, I've just taken the position over in, um, in a hospital to help them out where the man who retired is five years younger than me. Wow. He's got the right to retire, but he's, he's completely blown out. And I've said, don't worry, I, I can do it on one day a week. So I actually started 8.30 in the morning in the hospital, go around all the wards, go around all the units, talk to the staff, the patients. And on one day a week, they all know me by my Christian name. Wow. And then like today, this interview, I will be on call for three major hospitals, an emergency call out from five o'clock this afternoon till nine the next morning. And uh, if you get called out at two in the morning, I'm out of bed and in the car 16 miles away to a hospital. So what's the fallout of having, doing a 70 hour or 50 hour week now? Like The fallout is, with 50 hours now, I've got far more time to do other things. Mm. Where with 70 hours a week, it was bed and work. Now to me, you know, I've got 20 more hours on my back to my chart again. So I can play a few bowls, stopping with my wife most evenings now. Where before I was at every single night. Now she goes out more than I do. She goes and visits the children, the grandchildren, babysits. Leaves me to do a bit of reading, a bit of writing, write a book or watch telly, actually watch a bit of sport or, or documentaries. So now 50 hours a week, which would kill some people because it's more than they work now, mm. is giving me a time of relaxing. So I guess as I get better older, I'll put it down to 45. I've got no intention of retiring. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. If somebody wants to retire, they have every right mm. to mm. spend all their days doing other things, fishing, playing golf. Mm. My attitude is it's a privilege to work for Christ. Mm. Yeah. Why would I want to retire? What's your biggest strength? So they tell me I love people. I really love people. Awesome. Not just because of who they are. So, for instance, yesterday I was in a psychiatric block and uh, the manager said to me, oh, they just love you coming in. And I got a great passion for psychiatric illness. And one came to me, bless her heart, and she had to dance for me. And others wanted something else. Then I went into the courtyard where they're all smoking and they all decided to sing reggae for me. And um, when you've come from a background of being petrified all the time, 24-7, living in fear all your life, not being able to read and write, having phobias which stopped you talking to people, being frightened all the time, petrified all your time. When you've come out of that, if you're wise, you're no longer living it, but you don't forget it. Mm. So I look at broken people now and I think I'm looking at what I would have been if God hadn't stepped in. So why wouldn't I sit in the gutter with them? Why wouldn't I drink out of a tin mug? So people sometimes said to me, Pastor Day, when we see where you are, we couldn't invite you back to our one-bedroom flat. And I said, why? I come from a council house in Birmingham. All I ask you is the cup you give me, wash it mm. and boil the water. Mm. I don't care if I'm sitting on, on, on an orange box. Mm. It's never bothered me. I've walked away from that life of riches. Mm. I've walked away from all that. So what he's taught me is I can talk to film stars. I can talk to football stars. I can talk to lawyers. I've been, I had three hours with the Pope in October mm. when they had lunch with him at the Vatican. Lovely man, actually. He's a Protestant. He's a... No, he's, I'm a Protestant. Hmm. He's a lovely man. Hmm. I wasn't overwhelmed. I wasn't frightened. I could have walked straight out of there and spoke to a street bum and I'd have been just as comfortable. Hmm. And so my greatest strength is love for people and not playing up to them because they're important. Hmm. But by the grace of God, go I, you know, Paul said, it's amazing as a leader of influence, being able to posture ourselves really in a way that wherever we are, whoever we're speaking to, we can still be the same person on stage and off stage. It's something that isn't always easy to navigate. It isn't easy. The Bible says one should not think too highly of yourself. I locked the door of the mortuary the other week 
And uh, the lady, young lady there said, can I help you? I said, no, can I help you? I said, uh, how long you worked here? She said, 12 years. I said, how long since you had a visit from a chaplain? She said, I've never had one. I said, well, you're surrounded by dead people all day. I've come to have a conversation with you, tell you that you're valuable. And she filled up. Now, nobody, and I'm not condemning anybody, nobody thought she was valuable enough to go and knock the door of the mortuary. But I passed it, and I thought, I wonder who's in there. So I knocked the door, and there's this one woman running the mortuary, and she's surrounded by dead bodies all day and never speaks to anybody. Twelve years. For twelve years. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm your chaplain. I'll come to say hello to you and tell you you're valuable. Now, people go, wow, oh, that was incredible, Dave. And the answer is, would Jesus have thought of that? Mm -hmm. Or would he have said, oh, it's only dead bodies? No, he'd have gone in and raised a few of them. Mm -hmm. At least I raised their expectation mm -hmm. and said, you're valuable. Amen. And he's talking to the porters, mm -hmm. the women who pushed the sweet trolley around. In one of the hospitals I went to, she said to me, you're one of the only person that's ever respected me. Mm -hmm. I said, my darling, without the sweet trolley and the papers, the patients wouldn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. You are just a great girl. Mm -hmm. Is there a significant mentor that you've had on your journey? And what was the single piece of advice that stuck out with you from there? Theologically, it was my brother. Okay. My brother was my pastor for 18 years. Oh, and, wow. And he was one of the finest Bible teachers, and that's not nepotism, because for many years we didn't get on, and, and now he's retired and come to be in the church. But he was the provoker of my theology, and um, he, was, he was so well-educated. He got his doctorates and all that, and I, and I couldn't read and write. But he, um, he poured into me... And then he said to me the other week when I was preaching, he said, you have superb theology. Where did you get it from? I said, you. <laughs> and so he transformed my life. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the other, the other two would be an evangelist I worked with who used to see incredible healings, and he mentored me in the belief of the gifts of the Spirit. And the other would be the chairman of Sheffield Wednesday Football Club. Who's that evangelist? Uh, Eddie Smith. He's dead now. Okay. Uh, from Gloucestershire, he, he wasn't madly known, but we had some saw some incredible miracles at his hand. Mm. And the other was the chairman of Sheffield Wednesday, Bert McGee, who was the one who told me, David, if you can't put your argument on one side of A4, don't bother. And I used to go and sit with him, and he, he was the chairman of two big, massive companies in Sheffield, plus Sheffield Wednesday. And he was an old-fashioned businessman with a pinstripe suit, white shirt, white starch cuffs, fob watch, silver top cane, and he'd sit in his boardroom with his silver hair and he'd pour words of wisdom into me over business. Mm. And I thought, man, this man's done it. And he used to take me out for a meal once a month to the Amiga room in Sheffield where they have these big, massive Yorkshire puddings and all the food inside it. Mm. And I used to just pick his brains. Mm. So I'd say those three people mm. have um, really impacted my life. Mm. And, the, and the advice was that about condensing that idea onto a single side of A4 piece of paper. Yeah. Mm. And I've always found that now because most successful people read bullet points. Some mm. of the biggest business deals I've ever done, I've done all the work, got all the technical data out, and I've gone in and the boss has just said, I can give you 10 minutes. Mm. Mm. Have you got all the report for my accountant? So simply tell me what's the bottom line. How much is it going to cost me? 42000 a year. And what do I get for that? You get this, 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 this. Can I do that? No. How I got the business to do all the business for Sheffield Wednesday Football Club plus two other major companies is this, this Bert McGee phoned me one day and he said, Mr. Carr, I need to see you. Can you come and see me? And I said, yes, when? He said, three o'clock. I said, what day? He said, now. And put the phone down. And I was so desperate for business. I drove all the way to Sheffield walked in into the boardroom he sat there immaculately and he said sit down he said one of my managers his wife's dying of cancer uh, and i want him to be retired early can he do this and i went yes why because the law says you can do that can you do that no why because the law says that can i do the other and i said i'm awfully sorry mr mcgee i've never heard of that in my life i'm gonna to have to research it he said well, i think you can go i went pardon so you can go now, it took as long as it took me to tell you. I got back in the car, fuming, went all the way back to Birmingham office, and it took as long as that, thinking he could have answered me this on the phone. I'm sitting in my office, and the, and the chief executive, Sheffield Wednesday, phones up and said, oh, you've seen our chairman. I went, I don't go there. I dropped everything, cancelled everything, went all up to Sheffield, sat there, 
He asked me three questions. He said, I'll tell you what the questions are. He said, he asked you so-and-so, and you said yes. I said, yeah. He said, he asked you another question. You said no. I said, yeah. And then you said, I don't know. He said, yeah. He said, you've got a business for everything. Because the first thing he wanted to test in you, did you have the integrity to come up and see him? He knew the answers to those first two questions, and the other one was made up to see if you lied. So because you were committed, wow. you knew your job and told the truth, you've now got Sheffield Wednesday's business, you've got his other company's businesses, you're now the broker of everybody. Wow. Because you've got the time to listen to this business candidate, you've got the time for your client, you know your product, you tell the truth. That's it. Last question for you. What is it you're most fired up about right now? I believe that our nation has difficult times ahead. I think the world does. I think there is an intolerance of the Christian faith. All around the world, Christians are being terribly victimized. I believe he's going to come into this nation. I want to see the gospel priest as it should be. I'm writing a book at the moment called The Fading Doctrines of Jesus where I've noticed that in many even popular churches now, the teachings of Jesus are no longer preached. We're theme preaching now. Four ways to be happy. These, if you're a businessman, I know exactly the preaching techniques now. They're taking a lot of the preaching now out of business manuals, out of positive thinking manuals, which are good in themselves, but not the Bible. But we're not getting sermons anymore on justification, sanctification, heaven, hell, second coming, but covenants. We're not getting anything on, on any of these type of teachings now. And so we are breeding a entertainment driven Christian audience where now it's more important you've got the lighting right than you've got the spirit right and all those things are important and so my passion at the moment is to see the gospel come back see I can't remember the last time I've seen people weep the way to Christ we're not seeing many miracles we're getting crowds in because basically now in America a lot of people are leaving the charismatic churches the young people and they're going into the orthodox churches because they're saying We've been saved out of the nightclub, which is the dark places and the flashing lights. We've been saved out of that. So why would we want to come into the church like that? We want a church with absolutes that have been going like this for a thousand years. So there's a big, there's a big stir in America at the moment. Some mega churches are losing their kids to um, Anglo-Catholic churches, Orthodox churches, because they say there's stability there, which is different to what we've come out of. So my big passion at the moment is to see us not go backwards, but I want to see... Um, in the churches, good, solid teaching. And it's getting harder now because a lot of what we believe now has become socially unacceptable and legally unacceptable. And so we've got to watch that we don't get tainted and fashioned by the world. To reach the world, you don't become the world. You know, for me to reach a prostitute, I don't have to sleep with her. For me to reach a drunkard, I don't have to drink with him. I just have to have something in me which is better than what they've got. And Jesus sat with the prostitute, didn't sleep with her, and he sat with the drunk and didn't drink with him. And if what we are is relevant, then we can go anywhere and not do what they do and not be what they be, but they can see what we see. Amen. I have a saying, when we can kiss the unkissable, love the unlovable, touch the untouchable, then we're a value. Is there a book or a resource that you'd recommend to us, those who listen. Oh, hang on, out of all the books, I suppose you're gonna. I'm gonna give the obvious one, aren't I? Really, the Bible. Yeah. What changed my life was I was sitting in Australia, wait, waiting for the family to get up where I was stopping. When I was preaching there, and uh, when I couldn't read and write, God used to speak to me just in in a way that only a literate person could. I couldn't read about Him at that time, and He used to talk to me, and in a voice inside, and He said to me, even when I could read, He's always been the same. We've kept that relationship. And as I'm sitting up in bed, I'm flicking through my Bible, and the Spirit said to me, what are those red bits? I said, oh, these, those are your words, Lord. And he said, right, before you get up, because you're up early, read the book of Matthew and just read the red bits, and then come back to me. So I read the red bits, and I went back to him, and I went, I'm shocked, Lord, because there's two things here. We don't preach them anymore, because they're too severe. And B, they're very self-explanatory. So then I went on a quest, and for the next two years, I just read the red bits. So that now I know Jesus far better than I did. And when I hear people preach, I think he didn't say that. He didn't mean that. And we're one of the few faiths where you can spend the whole of your life reading and preaching and never mention Christ. We can preach on Elijah, Samson, Ezekiel, all good people. Never mention Christ. But Paul, 
who's the greatest of the apostles who wrote most of the Bible, New Testament, said, I only preach Christ and him crucified. To the intellectual, it's embarrassing, and to the religious, it's offensive. But to those of us who are being saved, which is an ongoing process, it's the power of God unto salvation. And so I would say the Bible changed my life. It taught me to read. It changed my life. And since I've read just the red bits, which is from Matthew through to Revelation, it's given me such a grasp of who he is. You can smell deception. So when I come across some things which are revivals and everything else, I go, no, that doesn't smell right. No, that doesn't handle right. No, that doesn't taste right. I said, well, how do you know? I said, well, I've been reading Jesus for so many years now. Jesus speaks against that. And then people say, I'm doing this, Pastor, because Jesus wants me to be happy. And I say, no, sorry, never said that. I said the opposite. Read that. And it's surprising how many of us Christians read lots of books about Christ, but we never read the book. Fewer people read the Bible now than ever before, and we've got it on our iPods and our iPhones and everything else now. Got that many versions, but if you used to do a survey, few Christians ever read the Bible. So I could tell yeah. you some very good books, but yeah, that yeah. one actually is the only one that's going to change your life. Wow. And everything you need is in there, all my business, everything I've ever done a business, I've always had confirmation of that, even getting married. He chose me a wife for the Bible. To me, they used to sell on Desert Island Discs. If you could take any book other than the Bible, mm. But they included the Bible every time on the desert island. Mm. I don't know if they still do, but that's what they used to say. Mm -hmm. And my attitude is if I can only have one book, you can, you can stick the rest, but the rest is only man's opinion to the Bible. Mm -hmm. The Bible's the Bible's opinion of itself. Mm -hmm. Back to what really matters, the Word of God. The Bible is it's given by inspiration of God. And the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for mm -hmm. every good work. Bishop, is there, is there one last parting word you want to give, a word of advice, a word of wisdom, just to encourage someone who's listening right now? Yeah, it's finding the balance. If you're a young businessman or woman, you can go to two extremes. You can either throw yourself into business and let your faith be compromised, or you can say, I've asked God to make me successful. And I, and I must say to you this, God does open doors, but only for those who are pushing. You've got to get off your backside. You've got to work. And, and I find, which may sound offensive to some of your listeners, that some of the worst people I've ever taken on in my life in business are Christians because they're free-willed. Their attitude was, well, God knows what he wants in my life. I've just got to pray about it and the business will come in. No, it won't. You know, Jesus went into the marketplace and at 12 noon when the sun was hot, he saw men who wouldn't go home till they could find a job. And when he talked about it, he took a month on the harvest. They were not layabouts. These men, they used to take them on at the beginning of the day, around about six in the morning. And these men hadn't been given a job at six in the morning, so rather than going home and watching television and playing Kumbaya on the guitar, they stood there through the searing heat of the day because they were desperate for a job. So when Jesus gives the story of the, of the laborers in the harvest, he walks in and he sees men standing there by the well waiting to get a job. And he takes them on and he puts them into the harvest. So my, my advice is to your clients is this. Don't lie in bed praying. Stand in the queue looking. And as you're looking for a job and you're chasing a job and you're chasing a client and you're chasing a contract, it's surprising how often God takes you on. But it doesn't come to those who only sit and wait. Be proactive. Have a bit of energy. So rather than, oh, no, I can't do any overtime because... I've got 14 prayer meetings about my future and I've got 16 people who see who's going to mentor me. Well, if you'd have done an hour's overtime, you'd have been on the line for promotion. Give your boss more than he asks for. As a Christian, go the extra mile. And so whatever job you're doing now, I, I finally I say this, when I take people on staff here from the secular world to work at the church, I expect a reference that says we're gutted that this person is leaving rather than thank God because I've been useless here. If you can't be successful in your secular job, you should never be full-time in ministry. You should step down to come into ministry, not up. And I know some people who train to be a pastor because they're going to get a pay rise in the house. Think, my God, what were they doing before? If you become full-time in ministry, you should step down to come into ministry. It's a servanthood, not up. And if you've got to step up to be a full-time pastor, heaven help what you were doing before. Because a pastor is a servant role, and not a boss. He that wants to be the leader must be a servant. And if you don't know how to serve, you make a rotten leader. Wow. Bishop, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today, man. It's been fantastic. It's been insightful. It's been interesting. It's been challenging. It's been lifting and encouraging. Yeah. Thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast. Please take time to go to our iTunes page and to share and like our podcast and share it with your friends. We really appreciate you. God bless you.